I can go back in my memory banks many, many years ago, back in the late 80s, I was the youth pastor at a church in Paris, Texas called Ramser Baptist Church. And Joe Schmidt, our speaker today, was the youth pastor of Bruton Road Baptist Church in Dallas. And that was one of those things, you, we got out of school and we were trying to, trying to do ministry and we were trying to do it alone. I was doing my thing and he was doing his thing and other youth pastors in the area were doing their thing. And we, we were struggling in being able to, to bring our ministries together and to be better as a core group as we're by ourselves. So we were at a pastor's meeting happened to be at my church, and Joe came up to me the first time I met Joe, and he said, man, these pastors are boring. Let's get out of here. So we snuck after these pastors. They were up there preaching away, and Joe and I went back to the youth room, and we sat down, and we talked for about 45 minutes to an hour, and we began a network of ministry partners. And now, if you're my age or older, you remember the old MTV network? Anybody remember MTV? Okay, that's telling your age. So that was back in the late 80s. The MTV was big. So we started our youth network called Metroplex Teen Vision, MTV. And we thought we were cutting edge. We thought we were it, MTV. So we would put MTV slogans all over the place, and kids were coming. We started having youth rallies. and It really developed into a good youth pastor network for our ministries. And it started the common bond that Joe and I have today in ministry, being able to network together with our pastor friends in order to to minister to a bigger group than just our entity on Sunday morning. It allows our influence to be greater than what one person can establish themselves. And Joe has been doing this. He's now, he's in full-time children evangelist work for how many years? 13 years ministering every week in different churches and different camps in different vacation Bible schools reaching many different kids to know the love of Jesus Christ. He's doing a phenomenal job. Joe has been invited back to our church again who we've had him many times but this week he is doing our vacation Bible school and I wanted you to get a taste of Joe and how he does ministry and what he does and the purpose behind him. What is his purpose and we love what Joe Schmidt and his family does. Now, when he, when he just thought about coming to Kansas, you know, some people would think yellow for shockers, and some people would think blue for that team north here. But other people, when they first think of Kansas, they say purple. So that's why I like Joe, because he thinks purple. Joe, come on up and preach to us. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's awesome. You know, we are stronger together than we are by ourselves. We are. A threefold cord is not easily broken, and I, I've, I've enjoyed knowing Bruce, and I've loved this church for years and years. You've blessed us in ways that you'll never know. Um, how many of you are here today? I just wanted to get a quick count. Raise your hand. <laughs> most, most of you are. Good. Who is not here? Would you raise your hand? There may be a few. Good, good. How many of you like to raise your hand? Raise your hand. No, really. Who does not like to raise their hand? Could I see yours? Okay, good. See, it's always important you got to know your audience. How many of you would raise your hand for any reason? If I just said raise your hand, you would do it. Raise your hand. How many of you have not raised your hand yet? Raise your hand. Good. How many of you would never under any circumstance whatsoever? You would never raise your hand. May I see yours? Just a few. That's good. That's good. How many of you believe that God will do something in your heart and life today if you deliberately place yourself in his hands? That's not a trick question. It's true. That's what he's waiting for, isn't it? God's waiting for us to put ourselves in his hands. A couple of uh, things that I, I, I needed to share with you. Um, on a sad note, there was a, a Jaime Meisenheimer, the man that invented the hokey pokey, passed away last Wednesday in Kokomo, Indiana, and uh, his funeral was yesterday, and uh, things went well at the church, but um, when they got to the graveside, it kind of fell apart because they put his left foot in, (laughs) his left foot out, (laughs) left foot in, (laughs) shook it all about. (laughs) Anyway, that's what it's all about as as, as far as I can tell. That was the bad news. There's worse news. Prices are going up. 
And I know I'm not telling you anything new. Down in Texas, our gas is up to about a buck and a half a gallon now. And uh, I'm just kidding you. We're paying what you're paying. But prices are going up. There's bad news. There's bad news everywhere. I want you to know, an evangelist brings good news. That's what we do. We like to bring good news. Um, part of the bad news, it's not, it doesn't just affect people. My dog is concerned about the rising prices. You know, Alpo is going up to almost $2 a can. Now, that might not mean a lot to you, but in dog dollars, that's about $14. <laughs> so we got a little, little problem going on there. Um, <laughs> Sometimes, friends, listen, uh, you know, it's about being in the right place at the right time. I love those songs that you did. I was even going to ask if we could maybe put up, put them up, uh, not, not all the words, but uh, maybe some of them. Again, I was looking at the words to, you are know, the God of this city. Friends, listen, there's, there's a world that needs to be reached. There just is. And, and we say, well, well, we'll reach the world for Jesus Christ. And that's an ambitious goal. And, and, and we ought to aim for that. But to tell you the truth, you personally are not going to reach the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. You're just not. I mean, you can't be everywhere at once. And so we say, well, I'm going to reach, I'm going to reach Wichita for the sake of Christ. And that, again, is a very ambitious goal. But you know what? You personally are not going to do that. You just can't. You're one person. But you could say, uh, I can do what I can where I am for as long as I can. Could you do that? That last song, I, I'd never seen that one before. If we're gonna, if we're gonna start, it's gonna start somewhere. Why not here? That's a good question, isn't it? And uh, if it's gonna start sometime, why not now? It's about being in the right place at the right time, and that's kind of what I wanted to share with you today. You know, there's a guy. He was a motivational speaker, and uh, had gone, uh, had flown into a city, and um, with all the the mix-ups in in luggage and and uh, delayed flights and storms and whatever, this this fella got. Uh, he got separated from his luggage and uh, managed to get to, the, get to the airport with enough time to get in a cab and go to the hotel where he was going to be speaking. He arrived at the convention center, sat down in the banquet hall uh, late, he sat at the table and then realized to his great horror that his dentures were in his luggage. And he, he's got to speak. And the guy across the table from him said, something wrong. He says, you look perplexed. And the guy says, I'm, I'm getting ready to speak. I don't have my teeth. And the guy said, well, hang on just a second. He reaches into his coat pocket and he set up some dentures on the table in front of him. He said, try those. And the guy goes, mm. well, he says, they're a little loose. He said, but thanks. The guy says, hang on. He reaches into his other pocket and he Sets another set of teeth in front of him. The guy says, mm, mm, they're a little tight. Oh, but, but thank you. The guy says, hang on, just try these. He reaches into his coat pocket and he puts a set of teeth in front of him. And the guy sticks them in and they're perfect. Well, he's announced. So he goes up and he, he gives this speech. And it is just thunderous applause when he's done. He goes back and he sits down at his seat and he says, man, you are a lifesaver. He says, he says, I've never been to this town before, but if I'm ever here and I need a dentist, I'm calling you. And the guy says, no, 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 I'm not a dentist. I'm a mortician. <laughs> but see, it's about, it's about being in the right place at the right time, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, I want to greet you in the name of my wife and my family. Um, Cindy would love to have been here, but she just could not... She couldn't take the four weeks that, that I've, been, I've been gone for, the, for about the last four weeks. And I, I'm heading home Wednesday, so that's real nice. I'll get a chance to see her. But I, but I do greet you in her name. She, she loves you and, uh, and loves the church. Um, we're we're going to kick off our Bible school tonight. Um, the theme is don't miss it. And so I encourage you, don't miss it. And we're, we're saying uh, uh, ages five through uh, fifth grade. Five through fifth grade. But, um, you know, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't have a problem if you show up, as long as you behave yourself, um, be a part of things with us. Our theme is don't miss it. There's a lot of things God is doing in our hearts and our lives. He's doing it all around us. And we'll miss it if we're not paying attention. You ever walked in on a, uh, you ever walked in to a movie and you're, and you're already late? For whatever reason, you walked in late 
and, and it's always real exciting. Something is always, always exciting has happened already, and you sit down and you're going, I think I missed something. Or you ever hear that laughter in the other room? And so you go walking into the other room and you say, what, what happened? They go, oh, that was, you missed it. Oh, it was so funny. And you say, what was it? They said, you know what, I just, I, it'll never, we can't tell you. You go, yeah, okay, thanks. We don't like to miss things. And here's the thing. God doesn't want us to miss things. There's certain things he really wants us in on. And so um, I wanted to share with you today, I'm going to be looking in the book of Acts chapter 3, if you want to turn there and, and, uh, and get ready for that. Two sounds you need to listen f for. This is the horn of silence. If, if you get out of control, I'm going to honk that. And uh, I'm just saying, sometimes you get a little rambunctious. You get a little rastafidious. You know, in a church setting, you get the, you get the feeling Leviticusly Deuteronomous at times. And uh, we're going to have to rein it in. The other uh, sound... Um, is this is what I call the bell of cheap applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. So anytime you... Thank you. You are very kind. So any, anytime... You are so kind. That is nice. Um, we got to... We can do that all day. <laughs> and we will. Teasing. Teasing we won't. I was just think a preacher might like one of those. And you're thinking, what do you get the pastor who has everything? Um, get him the bell of cheap applause. <laughs> you will have 50 of those next Sunday. I know you will. We're going to do vacation Bible school. I, I want you to know I like to do tricks. I don't do magic. Uh, this isn't magic. When, when God talks about magic, what he's talking about is uh, he's talking about something that is done under the power of Satan, something that's energized uh, by the occult. And I want you to know, I don't have anything to do with that. These are, I tell people, these are tricks that any five-year-old could do with 20 years of practice. Um, but, you know, when, when the Bible talks about magic, God is talking about things like witchcraft, sorcery, horoscopes, astrology, fortune-telling, that kind of thing. Anytime we give place to someone other than God, God says, you know what, I'm not going to compete with that. I hate that. I am the Lord your God. I will have no other gods before me. And so when we subscribe to, to magic in the sense of uh, what the Bible's talking about, we're, we're signing ourselves over to a, a, a power that is uh, condemned by God. So these are tricks. And, and, and I like to do tricks because they, uh, they help us remember what we hear by what we see. Um, this is a little trick I call the three rope trick. And I believe it's got a great name because um, I, I use three ropes and I do a trick. So whoever named that thing was spot on. It was awesome. But this is one, uh, this short rope, this is a little audience participation here. The short rope is going to represent people younger than you. How many of you know somebody younger than you? That's not a trick question. You either do or you don't. Okay, good, good. You can put your hands down. Oh, by the way, everybody say, ooh. Now that you got that out of your system. That's good. Now, this is the rope I call the medium-sized rope. Everyone say, ah. The medium-sized rope represents people your age. Now, how many of you in here are your age? <laughs> Come on. Yeah, even the women. And that's true. This is the rope I call the long rope. Everyone say, duh. <laughs> Pretty obvious. This is going to represent people older than you. Now, you don't need to point. <laughs> but do you know somebody older than you? Yeah, you do. So here's a question. Of these three groups of people, we've got people younger than you, people your age, and people older than you. If we were going to say, who does God want to not miss what he's doing? Who would you say it is? Which of these three groups? And a child yells, all of them. The adults are thinking it, but kids will say it. And I'd agree with you. But if we're going to say that we've got all of them, then we need three ropes the same length, don't we? I mean, you, you couldn't have the short one or the medium one or the long one. You, you would, you'd need the three, 
three ropes the same length. And so since they are, I, I agree with you 100%. God loves us all the same. He wants to do something in our hearts and lives. So you know what? If you come across someone younger than you, God doesn't want them to miss what he's doing. And you happen to come across someone who's your age, God says, I want them to get that too. And somebody older than you, friends, listen, God has some stuff that he does not want us to miss. So we've got to, we've got to tune in. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. That was nice. Thank you. That was good. We'll put that. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Very friendly. I feel loved and accepted. Acts chapter 3 is what we're looking at. I love this story. How many of you were in here for the Sunday school hour and you were watching the movie? Did you see that? I'll tell you what, it doesn't take much for me to get choked up. Even, even in, a, uh, in an artistic depiction, by the way, um, was it Randy that sang? Where's Randy? Girl's got some pipes. I'm just saying. That was awesome. And the band, I loved it. I'm watching Bryson over there just walking away on the base. I super glue that boy's feet to the floor. That was awesome. And I love the Paul McCartney bass there. That's, that's neat. How do you remember growing up with the Beatles and you saw Paul always holding the violin-shaped bass? Do you remember that? That's great stuff. Over here, it's, it's just music. Wonderful. I love the praise band. I loved everything about it. I was, um, I was thinking as they were singing those songs, you know, we, we don't just sing those songs just for no reason. We, we sing them because, you know, I think through a lot of prayer, uh, through a lot of prayer, the, the songs are chosen because the Lord the Lord says, I want to take you someplace. And, and the songs are not, that worship service we do up front, that's not just the disposable part of the service. That isn't where when we're on our way in, we say, oh, we've still got eight minutes. The band isn't done yet. I mean, that, that's, not, that's not bumper time, okay? It's not, it's not your little, it's not margin. It's not just free time. It is, it is coming here, and the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you about some things. He really does. He wants to, he wants to talk to you about some things. I didn't know the songs that they were going to be doing, and, and they didn't know what I was going to be preaching, or maybe they did. Because um, sometimes I tell people what I'm going to preach. So I think it's really neat how God works all of these things together. And um, so, so I'm sitting back there, and I'm watching the Jesus movie. And I'm watching how misunderstood he actually was in his day, and at least in the, in, in the, the depiction but it was very, it had to have been very, very similar like that. When Jesus comes on the scene, he reads the scroll in Isaiah that says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And he reads this, and you realize there was nobody else in the history of the world who could ever pick that scroll up, read those words, set the scroll down, and say, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. There's nobody could say that. And Jesus did it. And there was a dividing line that took place. You see, Jesus is divided from every other, every other person that's ever lived. He's God in the flesh. And what he says we need to pay attention to. I'm looking at Acts chapter 3, and I'm seeing Peter and John right now in there. Do you guys have words that you normally put up? Do you, do you put that up? Or you guys are following along here. Let, 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 me, let me share this, because this is a story that's real familiar. There's a danger that comes, ladies and gentlemen, when we, when we open the Scripture and say, this is a familiar passage. The, the danger is, if you've grown up in church or you've been around it at all for any length of time, what ends up happening is when you hear a pastor, a preacher, or somebody say, here's a familiar passage, the tendency is to listen to the first part of the passage and then say, oh yeah, I know that one. I know that one. Now see, well, that might work if you're talking about another book or something that you've read or a video that you've watched. I ask kids all the time, I say, how many of you have watched Finding Nemo? How many of you in here have? You've seen Finding Nemo? Okay. How many of you have only seen it one time? How many of you have watched it like 30 times? Monsters, Inc., 50 times. Okay. I mean, there's certain things that you know. We watch the same videos over and over again, and friends, listen, they're always the same. Oh, you might see something that you didn't see the last time, but it doesn't change your life. 
And so if I say to you, hey, why don't you come over? We're going to watch this movie. And you say, what are we going to watch? I say, we're going to watch Braveheart. You go, see, if I mention the word Braveheart, how many of you have seen that? You've already seen it? What if I say, we're going to watch Apollo 13? You've seen that. Gone with the wind. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. See, here's the thing. You might, you might determine whether you want to come over to my place and watch that because you're about to invest about three hours of time that you might not have watching something that you already know. And so for videos and other books, I would say, yeah, let that be kind of a guideline for you. But friends, listen. This is the Word of God. This will change your life every time you open it, if you let it. It doesn't matter if you've read the same passage over and over again. It will change your life every time you read it. Because this is the written word that points us to the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is in the process of changing us into his image. This word will change you, and it never changes, but it changes you. And so, you know, I, I think of the, the time when Jesus told a parable about a man who went out to plant some seed, and you remember this story. The sower went out to sow in Matthew chapter 13, and he took these bags of seed, and as he, as he sowed, he was, he, was tossing, he was tossing the seed everywhere, and Jesus said some landed on the pathway, very hard-packed soil. The birds flew down, and they, they snatched it up, and they devoured it, and that, that seed never came to fruition. He said there was some seed that he threw, and it landed on rocky soil. There was some, there was some uh, in, in that region, of course, very, very rocky land, and, and there was apparently some dirt over a shelf of rock, and, and you really couldn't see the rock underneath the dirt. And so the seed lands on it, it starts going down, but as that seed goes through the one or two inches of soil and the roots try to go through the rock, they can't. The heat of the day comes up, it heats up the rock, and so the sun from above and the heated rock from underneath burns up the root and that seed doesn't produce, Jesus said. And then he said there's also some of that seed that Jesus planted and it landed among the weeds and it started to grow, but the weeds grew up with it and they choked it. They choked it out. They took the nutrients from the soil, maybe just kind of intertwined their roots with the other and absolutely choked that out. Jesus said nothing was produced there. He said, but some of the seed did fall on good soil. And when it landed on the good soil, it started to grow. And when it produced, some of it produced 30, some of it produced 60, and some of it produced 100-fold. Now, the purpose of that story was not to say that the 30 was better than the 60 and the 60 was better than the 100 what Jesus was saying was that all of those were better than nothing. They produced something. Now, after the fact, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, tell us that story. What did, what did you mean by that? And it was a parable. If it was just a regular story, friends, listen, I'm, I'm with you. It's a boring story. If I asked my grandpa, hey, grandpa, you know, we're sitting around the fire ring up in northern Wisconsin during the summer, and we get that fire going, and grandpa comes out, and we've already had our hot dogs, and we've roasted the marshmallows, and we're sitting there, and we're waiting, and grandpa comes out, and he sits down, and we say, grandpa, tell us a story, and he starts with, well, there was a guy, he planted some seeds. And some of it got eaten by birds, and some of it landed on rocks, and it burned up. And some landed in weeds, and it got choked out. And some of it landed on good soil, and it grew. The end. I'm going to ask him if he took his meds that morning. <laughs> Grandpa, you okay? Should we check your blood sugar or something? Because boring, but here's the thing. Listen, I agree. And, and Jesus, it wasn't just a story. It, wasn't, it was a parable. See, a parable is a story that utilizes things that we know to tell us about some things that we can't know otherwise. And so afterwards, the disciples suspected there's something up to the approach. Jesus, they said, what was that all about? He said, I'm going to tell you about this. He says, the seed is the word of God. 
Friends, listen, you got to have that. You got to get that. This is good seed. This is good seed. Every word in there is good seed. And it has the potential to grow and produce. But the question is, when it lands, what kind of soil is it hitting? And realize this, every time you open the scripture or every time pastor gets up to preach or your Sunday school teacher or somebody gets up to share the word of God with you, your brain becomes a type of soil. And Satan can't wait to come and snatch the word out so that it won't change you. That's why sometimes when you say, this is a familiar passage, Satan says, you don't need to listen. And you go, yeah, I don't need to listen. I'm going to think of something else. And it can't produce. Sometimes you make a decision. You hear the word of God and it changes your heart. And you're going, you know what? I need to start doing that. But then you run into some resistance from friends or family. And you say, I forget it. And it can't grow. And sometimes you make a decision. You say, you know what? That makes sense. I'm going to do that. I am going to do that. Because you've heard the word of God and it's spoken to your heart on a profound level. But then all, all of a sudden, there's, uh, there's another thing. There's a conflict. Oh, man, I can't do that because I got this other thing going on. Oh, well, it would have been nice, but I can't. And the Word of God gets choked out, and it won't produce. And it's not because the seed was bad. It's because the soil was bad. And then he said, but some of the seed fell on good soil, and it landed, and it started growing, and it produced some 30, some 60, some 100. Friends, listen, every time... Even though you go to a familiar passage, God says, my word going in will do something in your heart and in your life, but it depends on if you are willing to receive it or not. God will change you, and he'll always use his word to do it, and he'll conform you to the image of his son. My mom used to have a saying, bloom where you're planted. Any of your moms have some sayings? You remember those momalies, those little momisms that would be told? My mom had some great ones. Birds of a feather flock together. Tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you who you are. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Sit down and eat your vegetables. I heard that a lot. She used to say this, bloom where you're planted. It didn't make a lot of sense to me until I became a Christian. You see, I'm not on this earth by my appointment. I'm here by his appointment, by God's appointment. And wherever I find myself, or whatever circumstance I find myself, it never catches God by surprise. I cannot control my circumstances, but I can certainly control what I do when I'm there. If God is the God of this city, if he's the God of this nation, and if he's the God of you, he's got something he wants you to do. And if we're going to start something, why not here and why not now? Why not? Why don't you, you know, let it begin with you? So Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth, was being carried who they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. And seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. But what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I got a couple of points I wanted to share with you today. Number one, be where you're supposed to be. I want to be an encouragement to you. Oh, bloom where you're planted. Look at that. It's as though we got it together and planned this. And yeah, we did. Bloom where you're planted. Be where you're supposed to be. Let me ask you this. If you were a Jewish man 
back in those days when Peter and John were, at the hour of prayer, where are you supposed to be? In the temple. Is that where you're supposed to be? It's real interesting. So here's Peter and John, and they're going where they're supposed to be. Now, friends, listen, I just want to encourage you. Be where you're supposed to be. Now, I can't tell you where that is. I don't know where that is. I know there's some places you shouldn't be. I know there's some inter Internet sites you should never be at. There's probably some physical, geographical locations you should never find yourself at. But be where you're supposed to be. At the hour of prayer, Peter and John are going into the temple. It's real interesting because as they're going in, they see this guy. Now, let me ask you this. Peter and John, do you think this is the first time they've ever gone into the temple? I don't think so. They've been in probably thousands of times, literally, over the course of their lifetime. As they've gone into this temple, let me ask you this. Do you think they'd ever seen this man sitting by the gate before, this crippled man? Do you think they'd ever seen him before? He's sitting by the same gate. You look in the book of Acts chapter 4, look in the next chapter, and we're going to see that the man was over 40 years old. This happened to. It's an interesting thing about this guy. When this man was born, he's a little baby, and he's just as cute as can be. And I love those little babies. I love them. I love them more now that I think since I'm a grandpa. I, I love them. And, and by the way, listen, let me thank you, those of you that have been praying for my little granddaughter, Harper. I want to tell you, too, there's a little girl, Emily Grace, that truly needs your prayers right now. Really does. And her family really needs you to lift them up. Little babies are so precious. We are allowed to, to make faces and noises at babies that we can't make at any other person on the earth. And we delight in it. We can do that. Because it's a baby. Because you know what we're trying to get them to do? We're trying to get them to smile so we can say, she smiled at me. And even when you're told it's a gas bubble, you know better. It's not. When they give you that look, she smiled at me. No, I think she's got gas. But we make noises and faces at babies you can't make at anybody else. You go to work tomorrow. And when your boss says, good morning, you go, you do that. Let us know how it works. It ain't going to work. So this guy is born, and mom and dad are thrilled. They got this little, little guy. But they notice right off the bat that even though his hands are working and he's crying, he's got all of that going on, they're noticing that his legs aren't working. That's a tragedy. In those days, that boy is doomed. Nowadays, we've got all kinds of therapy and all kinds of things, opportunities for people to, be, to have some rehabilitation and therapy. And we can, we can bring folks with these, with these handicaps, these disabilities, we can bring them to a point of tremendous productivity. And I think that's great. Back then, this guy, the only thing he had to look forward to was being a beggar. That's what his life was going to consist of. As soon as he was old enough, as soon as he was old enough and cute enough to sit by a gate and hold out a little cup or a bag or a little bag of, uh, you know, a little basket or something and shake it at people and say, brother, can you spare a dime as they're going into the temple to pray? As soon as he was old enough to do that, that became his job, and for his entire life, that's what he had been doing. Probably, if he was in his mid-40s, I guess he's been doing it since he's about five or six. When he's old enough to sit there, could you imagine being carried every day to a gate where you stick out a cup and look at the people going by, many of whom are judging you, Remember John chapter 9? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Do you remember that? Because that was the mindset. You're crippled like that because God is punishing either you or your parents. Someone is paying the price for sin. And so there were probably many people, as this kid was sitting there saying, have you got some money? I said, I'm not giving any money to you, you sinner. Well, you want me to bring God's wrath on me for helping a sinner? And then there were others probably who felt sorry for him and gave him some dough. 
but he's been begging a long time. You know how humiliating that is? You ever watch Cinderella Man? Did you ever see that? He's a boxer against all odds. But the money's run out, and he's got to go. And, and he walks into a place where these wealthy folks are sitting. And he stands there, and it's obvious that he is out of place. And you can see the humiliation for this man who is very proud of his work and his ethic. His, his ethics are, 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 are high. His personal values are very high. And for him to come and to say, I'm really struggling right now. Could you help me with some money? And you watch how these guys are turning their eyes away and they're just looking at him. And he stands there. It's humiliating. And then, friends, listen, some people are where they are because they chose to be there. But you know what? There are some other people who have found themselves on the wrong side of circumstances, not because of anything they had done, but because it came to them. This is why we need to be very careful when we are saying who is worthy and who is not worthy of receiving. Be real careful. We pulled into, a, uh, we pulled into an area down in South Texas one year. We were getting ready to do a vacation Bible school. It was raining to beat the band. The kids were back at the hotel. We'd left a lot of kerosene matches and knives with them. We wanted to have a little fun while we were gone. I'm teasing. I'm just checking if you're awake, that's all. <laughs> Kerosene matches and knives, that sounds like fun. <laughs> so Cindy and I went to get some groceries. We go to the store, and as we pulled up, there's these bags of deer corn or some kind of bird feed or something sitting out there. And, and we're nosing up. We're trying to get as close to the, the building as we can because it's raining. We want to be able to get in under the overhang and get in and get the grocery shopping done. So we nosed into this one spot, and my headlights are lit up on a guy who is sitting on top of the, these bags of fertilizer or manure, or whatever it was. Maybe not at a grocery store. Maybe it was deer corn. They sell manure at grocery stores? Probably in the deli. I'm just teasing. But anyway, out front there are these bags. So he's, he's sitting on these bags. And we pulled in, and I'm looking at this guy's face, and I'm going, I'm thinking, oh, great. This guy's going to hit us up for some money. Oh. So I go like this. Cindy, I want to come around and let you out. I'll keep the door between you and him. Go around the back of the car. So I got out, I shut my door, I went around like this. I opened her door, put my back to the guy. She got out, I shut the door. We went around these other cars, right in the store. I went, yes. I got all my change still. <laughs> We're going through the store. We're shopping. We're getting some stuff, because we need some snacks and refreshments and that. So anyway, I'm in the checkout line, and I'm looking through the window. The guy is still there, right in front of my truck. So I'm saying, all right, Cindy, when we get out, I'll push the cart. You get behind me. I'm going to go around. We'll open up, put stuff in the back. I'll open your door. You get in. Look down. Play like you're adjusting your seatbelt. I'll get in. I'll fumble for the keys. We'll back out. And I will still have all the change in my pockets. That's what I'm thinking. So I tell her all this. So I go out, and I got the shopping cart, and I'm looking, and she's, she's supposed to be behind me. I'm at the car, and I'm ready to get in. I look. I'm going up to her door. She came out the entrance closest to the man with a bag of groceries and food and some money and she said I'd like you to have this in the name of Jesus and I said yeah we wanted you to have that <laughs> I didn't say that I'll tell you what you could have I don't know what you could have done to me to squash me any lower 
I don't, I don't even have words to this day. I can't describe to you the humiliation, the shame that came to me. Because you know what I'm getting ready to do that evening? I'm going to go tell people about Jesus. I mean, decent folks. Decent folks who dress nice and don't sit on deer corn outside a grocery store and ask for money. You see, there's something about it. I don't know that guy's circumstance. But I didn't have to know that guy's circumstance. See, my wife listened to what Jesus said to her, and she said, well, let me do something. Well, Lord, I'll, sure, I'll give him something. So this guy's sitting here, and he's got his cup out again. And he says, have you got some dough? And Peter looked at him. He says, with John, he says, hey, look at us. And so the man looks at him, and you know what? This takes something because it's the hour of prayer. There's a lot of people going into the temple that day. I mean, there's a lot of people going, and that's where people go to pray. And so it's the hour of prayer. It's like, it's like you know, rush hour. They're all going in, and this guy's going, you know, he's looking for all these different people. He's got this cup, and he's holding it in front of all these different people, and all of a sudden he hears, look at us. And whoa, and he, he whoa, there they are. And he looks right at Peter and John, and Peter looks at him and says, I don't have any money. I don't know what you're thinking if you're that guy. <laughs> I'm thinking, why are you wasting my time? But what I do have, I'm going to give it to you. And I don't know what the guy's thinking. Has he got an emerald or a jewel or something in his bag or pouch or maybe a wood carving or something of value that he's going to give to me and I'll be able to sell it and get some money? He looks right at him and he says, in the name of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. The guy's hand is still out. Peter, you remember what he did before he was a follower of Jesus? Do you remember what his job was? He's a fisherman. He wasn't like fisherman like we see now. Well, today on American Bass Pro, we're going to be out in Lake Kookaboogie, and we're going to be trying out the three-toed wiggly jigger here, and I want to try to put it up there in the weeds, see if we can pull the big ones in. I mean, my goodness, you don't need to be strong to do that. You just need to have a bass boat, and somebody's got a TV camera. Peter, this guy is massive, I think. Think Bruce Thomas. Huge, huge. Think. Peter has made his living taking huge nets, throwing them over the side of a boat, watching those things sink beneath the water, getting soaked with water, getting full of fish, and then pulling them out again. This guy, I think, is huge. He's standing there. The man's hand is still out. He says, what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk, and he lifts the guy up. And I'm sure this guy's going, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't walk. I can't. That's a miracle, friends. Listen, the man was standing there. His ankles, his feet bones, everything that needed to go together went together. He was standing there, but the miracle was even, even more profound than that. He didn't have to learn how to walk. The Bible tells us immediately he went into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. You've seen toddlers learn to walk, and it's one of the cutest things in the world. Get that on video. Put it on Facebook quick. They're something so cute, and they don't hurt themselves. My goodness, they got a lot of padding there, but they're also real close to the floor. You know, it hurts for me. I take this tumble. I'm going to break something for sure. But you get that little one, boom, and it's so cute. And then they, they get up. But this man never, never had to learn to walk. He didn't have to teach him. God reworked it. He put, he put it already in. He put, the, put it in his memory. He stuck it in his brain. This is how you walk. The man was walking, leaping, praising God. He went into the temple, and he's yelling, and he's saying, look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. I'm healed. I'm oh, praising the Lord. It's because Peter and John were where they were supposed to be. And then you know what they did? They did what they were supposed to do. 
They did what God told them to do. If you're keeping track of such things and, and writing things down, that's, that's, this is my encouragement to you. Like Peter and John, listen, be where you're supposed to be. And then do whatever God tells you to do. You see, when, when, when we showed up at that grocery store on that day in South Texas, Cindy did what God told her to do. I didn't have time for it, you see. Peter and John said, and, and even though they may have seen this guy dozens and hundreds of times, and I don't know why they never did this before, but it wasn't time. Have you ever seen the same person at Walmart? You ever see the same person at the grocery store? You ever see the same person where you go to eat? Some of you are gonna go to your favorite restaurant right after we leave here. How many of you have a place to eat when, you're, when you go? After, after services, you're gonna go eat somewhere. Nobody's gonna eat, you're not gonna eat anywhere? I'm looking for whose hands go up because I'm, I'm still looking for a lunch date. And I'm teasing you, I've got a, I've got a lunch date. I'm, I'm, I've got a lunch date. Um, you see those people all the time. And I, I say this a lot of times to kids, you know, at school, you start in school on Wednesday. Woo-hoo! The cry goes up from the parents. <laughs> kids are going, oh, man. It's just the way it is. There will come a day you never have to go back to school again if you don't want to. Override that urge and keep going. Keep going. Get as much as you can for as long as you can. Um, I was three years in the fifth grade. I loved it. It's awesome. Best three years. So get all the education you can. You're going to go somewhere. You're going to see the same people. Now, I'm not saying you have to talk to everybody you see every time you see them. But if you're where you're supposed to be, and you know what, Walmart can be a place you're supposed to be or, or, or whatever, wherever you shop. That corner grocery store, that gas station where you always go in, you always get $20 worth of gas, and you, and you see that same cashier all the time. That's where you're supposed to be. You need to go through life. You need to do the things that you're supposed to do. But have you ever made room for the fact that maybe God wants to crack into it somehow and has something that that person needs to know that you already know? See, that's what happened to Peter and John that day. We're not told that the Holy Spirit impressed it on them, but you know what? They had the power of the Holy Spirit active in their lives. Why else would they say, hey, guy, look at me? And the guy looks at him. Now, Peter and Don, John just didn't walk around doing miracles willy-nilly everywhere they went. They just didn't. But there were times when it was so absolutely overpowering the power of God on their lives. And you've seen this before. I know you have. If you've ever been led by the Spirit of God, you know sometimes that thing comes into your brain and you're saying, really, God? And he says, really? You go, wow. Okay. So be where you're supposed to be and then do what God tells you to do. The last thing I want you to see is this. Use, use that moment to share the message. Now, in your own personal devotion time later this week, maybe what you want to do is take Acts chapter 3 and read through that. And you'll see after this guy got, got healed, the people came running out into this area where Peter and John were. They said, what's going on? What did you do? And Peter said, oh, hang on now. I'm glad you asked. You think this guy is healed because we did something? Let me tell you who did this. Friends, sometimes if you stop with the miracle, you'll miss the opportunity to share the message. So don't do that. Take the moment that God gives you and always put the Lord Jesus on display. Always point it back to Jesus. Always point it back to Jesus. Here's what happens. Let me give you a little invitation here. Um, I want to show it to you this way. I got this little vase, I picked this up not so long ago, and it's real nice. You can put a lot of stuff in it. I'm imagining for just a minute that we take the Word of God, you know, and, and sometimes we take the seed of the Word of God and we plant it, and, and, and Satan says, oh, you don't need to listen to that, and nothing happens. And sometimes you take the seed of the Word of God and maybe it, it falls kind of on that rocky soil. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we think, man, that's a good idea. Some of you are saying, you know what, I am gonna start doing this, I'm gonna really start looking for this. But then the opportunity comes and maybe people start making fun of you 
and nothing happens. And then sometimes maybe the word of God goes into your brain and you're saying, you know what, man, this makes sense. I want to do what God tells me to do. I want to share the message. But then it gets choked out. You had some opportunity and maybe something else was, there was a better thing that came along in your estimation. And maybe it was just this fleshly, physical thing came along and you went, ah, I'll, do I'll do it next time. I'll, I'll do that thing. And, uh, and there's no fruit. There's nothing occurs. But you know, friends, listen, there, there is a time when the word of God does go in. And I'm hoping maybe today that this is what it is with you. That the word of God goes in. And then it finds good soil. Because when it does, boom, don't miss it. Because here's what happens. The word of God goes in. And amazing things take place in you. And then you take this opportunity. God has given you this great opportunity. The message goes in. And you take it and you put it on display for everybody to see. So maybe you're here today and this makes sense. You're saying, you know what, I, I just never really looked at it. I go to the same place all the time. I keep seeing that one person. And I've asked them before how they're doing, but I've never really cared to listen for their answer. Maybe I need to start listening for that answer because maybe God wants to use me in their life. I do want you to know this too. You can no more represent God in those situations if you don't know him. If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the thing that gave Peter and John the boldness to be able to do those things is because they had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross to take away their sins and who died, was buried, was raised from the dead and then gave them the Holy Spirit to live in them, to lead them and guide them and direct them. And if friends, listen, if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got some folks here at Glenville who would love to talk to you about how you can have that relationship with Jesus. How you can enter into that born again relationship where you're made spiritually alive. But maybe you're here today and you've already given your life to the Lord and you're saying, you know, man, this makes sense. I go to a lot of the same places all the time. I just thought it was about shopping. But I'm realizing maybe shopping isn't about shopping. Shopping is kind of the secondary thing to what God wants to do with me in the lives of other people. So maybe it makes sense. Let me pray with you, give you that invitation. If you've never given life to the Lord, do you normally stand during your invitation times? I think that might be good. Let's do that, let's stand up. And um, we're gonna have some music up here and uh, let, let me make this offer to you. You're here today and perhaps you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus and somehow you were just drawn here today and, and you're here and man, this makes sense. I like this, I like these people. Well, God brought you here for a reason. It's because he wants to introduce you to his son. And if you've never met Jesus, there's some folks here who would love to talk to you and visit with you. And, and some of you others, maybe this whole message thing made sense today. You said, you know what? I am going to be where I'm supposed to be. I, I, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And I don't want to miss my opportunity to share the message. And you're saying today, God, would you, would you help me to do that? Maybe you'd like to just come and pray and talk to the Lord about that. I give you that opportunity right now. Let me pray. And then as the music comes, the brother Al's going to come. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to pray. You do what the Lord tells you to do. Okay, let's bow, shall we? Father, I thank you for this time. Thank you for your message. Thank you for your word, Lord. I know it'll change our lives every time we open it. And I pray that you will uh, really magnify yourself in our in our thinking through your word. Help us to realize that we don't live for ourselves. We don't die for ourselves. We, if we live, we live for you. If we die, we die for you. And whether we live or die, we're yours. So Lord, help us to remember that uh, we're not our own. We are bought with a price. And we're supposed to be in that spot that you put us and then listen to you as, as we're there. Lord, help us always to put the Lord Jesus on display in every way, in every, every opportunity we can. If something's going to start, maybe we can start it. And if it's going to start, maybe we can take a look at doing that now, wherever you put us. Give us a good time of invitation in Jesus' name. We pray it. Amen. Amen. You do what the Lord tells you to do. And Brother Al